Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to The Lookout. My name is Zeke Lunder. I've uh, been working in fire intel and fire mapping for about 25 years and uh, run this website to provide public information on fires in Northern California. Um, not <coughs> officially assigned to any of the incidents I cover. Uh, Lookout's uh, it's my own project. And we do it to help people better understand what's going on with wildfires and forestry and land management. So today we're going to talk about the McKinney fire burning near Wairika. This fire started a couple days ago. Today's the 31st of July. So we're going to jump into looking at some maps here. So we're looking at the fire from uh, with north at the top. Wairika's on the right. Uh, Scott Bar on the left. These blue areas around here are fires that have happened in the past uh, about eight years. Frying pan fire on the edge here um, burned from Happy Camp all the way over to the Scott River. In 2016, we had the Gap Fire. 2014, the Beaver Fire. Uh, Beaver Fire started during a big lightning bust in July. Anyway, the McKinney Fire started down here, um, kind of between Horse Creek and Quigley's Resort, um, two days ago. And first day, it spread about 30,000 acres. And... Um, Yesterday, in about 12 hours, it spread about another 20,000 acres, mainly out here towards the east, towards Wairika. Um, the white line shows the 12-hour growth yesterday. And so you can see, you know, some portions of the fire, the fire kind of ran out of slope to run up uh, on the first day. And then that often happens. Fires like to run uphill faster than downhill. And so when they hit the top of the hill, they oftentimes come down the hill a lot slower. So that's what's that's one of the things that's slowing the fire spread along this whole edge of it is that it ran to the top of the mountains in the first burning period. Yesterday, um, with the thunderstorms that were over the area, we had what we call outflow winds, which is when you've got a lot of um, air that <coughs> builds up into these columns, so these towering clouds, and then um, as it cools, it sinks and pushes out across the landscape. So yesterday we had some really kind of remarkable uh, movement of smoke and air. And the smoke could really show you how those outflow winds were pouring across the landscape. So here's Wairika. Yesterday at noon, the fire was about 10 miles away. Um, this mapping of the orange line here is from about midnight last night. And at that point, the fire was about five miles away. Um, we've got some satellite heat points that show the fire is across this creek now and established into here but that's not confirmed at this point and we don't like to really publish that stuff unless we can confirm it from another source just because uh, we saw on the first day that the satellite heat was pretty inaccurate showing the fire several miles south of where it actually was one thing uh we talked about on the lookout website yesterday is just that when we have a big fire like this it usually takes us several days to um, prepare what we would call an indirect fire line that's you know bulldozer line or a road system or, or something else where we can do a firing operation to try to uh, deprive the fire fuel before it gets there. So what happened really in the first day, um, the first night really, is that the fire got burned right past a bunch of places that would have been kind of our first choice for uh, tactical firing operations, like this ridge that runs up above Horse Creek on Bald Mountain or this ridge line here that's the divide between... Um, Scott Valley and the Klamath. Anyway, since the fire's over those ridges, you know, we no longer have that tactical opportunity to put in a dozer line, fire it. And so even though this fire is not spreading quickly down to the south, it's significant that it's over the ridge and well established just because, you know, we don't have the option now of holding it on this major ridge system. And holding fires on mid slope lines is really difficult. Uh, yesterday around noon when it was flown the fire had about 55 miles of active perimeter so just from a kind of workforce standpoint that's a, a lot of line to chop it's a lot of even with bulldozers or uh, you know air tankers that's a lot of line to secure and then that doesn't count you know these little spots and so it just means that we're going to be dealing with this fire for a long time and that this portion at least um it's well into this kind of rugged inaccessible land where we don't have a lot of options. You can see that moving farther to the east too here um, around McKinley Mountain. 
you know, it would have been nice if we had more time to be able to, you know, run a dozer line along this ridge, fire out and keep the fire on that side of the divide. Didn't happen. And so basically we've, we haven't got a lot of options for kind of a big box to contain this thing. Uh, the last good option moving towards Wairika is this ridge system here. And really that's just a matter of timing. You know, if the fire doesn't make a big run today or tomorrow, you know, there might be time to put in, I'm sure there's already a bunch of dozer line being pushed on this ridge. There's been dozer line pushed in this country a lot in the past. Um, Siskiyou units used to fighting fires in this country. So, you know, people know this ground really well. And if it's possible to get a line in there, they're doing everything they can to get it in. But um, the way the fire activity has been, you know, I don't really have any intel on what's going on on this flank of the fire uh, suppression wise. One concern here is just that the fire has been moving fairly slowly in the 2014 beaver fire. Um, in this area here, we haven't had fire for a long time. And so if the fire does cross the road here today, uh, we could have a slope driven run in heavy dry fuels that could really cause a lot of problems and really expand the whole kind of um, scope of what firefighters are going to have to deal with here, pushing up uh, towards Hilt and towards Siskiyou Summit. This is Siskiyou Summit at the top here. Ashland's still uh, way out there. Uh, 23 miles from the fire. The fact that the fire is established in the Beaver Fire already means firefighters are going to have to deal with it over here. But um, one thing that's going on in the Beaver Fire that is interesting is that we've got a lot of um, private timberlands in here. And following the 2014 Beaver Fire, a lot of this land was salvage logged where they cut down all the um, dead trees on the private lands and planted new trees and sprayed herbicide and basically um, are controlling the brush. So that's really um, can help in reducing fire intensities here. And so uh, stopping the fire in this fire area is kind of more a function of whether or not there's enough resources than um, than anything. So that fire for the um, for the meantime is buying some advantage in that the fire, as you can see yesterday, where it spread, you know, 15,000 acres towards Wairika, it only spread, you know, maybe a half mile here. So the good news is that the fire's got a ways to go before it chunks out of the beaver fire. The bad news is that um, there's not a lot of great spots to um, engage the fire mid-slope. And once it gets out of the beaver fire scar up into this heavier timber, um, it's going to be kind of a way again. One thing that's interesting here in this particular scar is that in 1955, we had the Dutch Creek fire and Haystack fire in this area that caused a lot of damage. And then following that, um, there was a lot of plantations put in. So we've got these 60 year old trees densely spaced. And a lot of these, um, in a lot of these places, the trees after they were planted didn't really get thinned that drove this really kind of volatile explosive fire behavior during the beaver fire. So we might anticipate that if the fire becomes established in these areas that didn't burn in the beaver fire, that um, we could see some really pretty incredible fire behavior. We're going to be keeping an eye on that. Um, the infrared last night also picked up this new start. Um, may or may not be a spot fire. To me, it seems unlikely that it's a spot fire. We did have lightning yesterday. And that um, was about 60 acres when it was mapped by infrared, and it was about 100 acres um, with the satellite imagery at 3 a.m. So that expands the scope of this incident also. So it'll be interesting to watch um, the fire spread in these burns. You know, um, what we've been seeing recently on fires like um, the Oak Fire in Mariposa County is that fire behavior does change when it gets to recently burned areas. But that benefit doesn't last forever. So we can see that the fire is actively spreading in this eight-year-old burn. Um, but it, we do know that based on w the way the fire behaved in 2014, that it would have really screamed out of there a lot faster had this area not been a burn scar. Fire did move uh, about a mile downstream towards Horse Creek last night. Coming around to Scott Bar, um, 
as I mentioned before, fire's just um, kind of backing down into Mill Creek. One thing that we see often, even during times of extreme drought, is that a lot of our backing fire is beneficial and may not kill a lot of the larger trees. So we always try to take a look at that on the lookout. Um, you know, not all fires is bad. The landscape here has evolved with a lot of fire, and one of the biggest problems we've got on this landscape is a lack of fire. And so uh, we'll be keeping an eye on these places that are having this slow backing spread and following up in the future to see what kind of fire effects we get there. And, um, you know, we'd like to point out when we do get that beneficial fire effects. So uh, if you're just watching for the fire intel, that's um, that's wrapping up the current fire situation. We'll we'll update our Twitter feed, Wildland ZKO or Wildland Zico, uh, with intel as it comes in during the day. Uh, appreciate the the people that are making this data. This is um, the white line here came from Cal OES via their virus program, and the red outline data is flown by what we call NIROPS, National uh, Infrared Operations, which is based out of the NIFC, the National Fire Center in Boise. Uh, NIROPS has been doing this for a really long time. Uh, when I first started out my career, uh, they'd fly over with these Vietnam era scanners that would print the fire onto this kind of funky black and white fax paper and they'd roll it up in a little plastic tube and they'd drop it out a hole in the floor of the plane as they did a touch and go at the nearest airport. Then the infrared interpreter would run out there and they'd have a little blinking light and beeper inside the tube so you could find it at night. And then the um, interpreter would transfer it onto a topo map and then um, someone else in fire camp might hand copy that onto you know 10 different topos so all the divisions might have the infrared drawn on a topo. So it's come a long way. We appreciate these guys um, and gals who do this work. Uh, someone has to kind of look at all this stuff and draw these squiggly lines for us. So we'll probably get some more infrared during the day today. I'm going to shift gears here and talk a little bit about uh, land management history here now of this area and some of the kind of challenges and um, factors of how it affects our fire behavior. All right. So what are all these yellow splotches here in our fire? Uh, this is land ownership. There's this thing we call the checkerboard. Basically what happened was when we built the railroads in this country, they gave um, every other section along the railroad corridors to the railroads as an incentive to build the, build the country, right? And so we've got this every other section now. Um, and a lot of these places is for service and alternates with private timberland. So we go down the I-5 corridor, all the way down to Lake Shasta. You can see that checkerboard pattern. Some places they got six miles every um, side of the railroad, other places they went farther. So this goes back to like the 1800s, late 1800s. So we've got basically um, this overlay, cultural overlay on the landscape of land ownership that affects how the land's managed, right? So here, here's an example of uh, down kind of uh, east of Castle Crags. We've got an area we had a fire in 2012. And after the fire, the private timberlands were salvage logged, um, sprayed for brush control, planted back into plantations. The public land, that wasn't, that didn't happen. Uh, they, they didn't log. A lot of the trees didn't die on the public lands. I mean, a lot of the trees didn't die on the, the private lands as well. But you can really see this contrast. And so when you zoom out at the kind of landscape scale, you can see this checkerboard pattern across the whole landscape. These smaller areas out here are clear cuts on private timber lands. Not a lot of clear cuts um, in the last 40 years or so on the public lands. So this creates a lot of problems for us as land managers, as fire managers, because the private timberlands have a lot different land management objectives than the public lands. The public lands are supposed to be managed for the kind of maximum public benefit for watershed values, for wildlife. Private timberlands, they, you know, they're trying to maximize their return on investment. When there's a fire, they need to cut down the trees and grow more trees because that's really how they make money off the land. So when fires burn into this checkerboard landscape, 
it's really difficult because the Forest Service manages fires um, with an emphasis on firefighter safety. Uh, they want to control the fire, but some places, um, you know, where we're getting good fire effects um, or where it's difficult access or whatever else, the Forest Service tends to back off more and look for ridges and other ways that they can kind of tie together the whole landscape with a big strategy and do a firing operation. So, for example, on the HERS fire, there was a strategy to put in a big, uh, big box, basically, and contain the fire with a federal team. So when you hear um, the term unified command, they're talking about having CAL FIRE and Forest Service both kind of in charge of the same incident. And uh, we all kind of know how well it works to have two bosses. In this case, you've got two different bosses that have two different objectives or management strategies or philosophies. So it gets really difficult. Even if the command structure is clear and the Forest Service incident commander is in charge, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of drama and um, heartache that happens on these joint command fires. Uh, some of that drama just includes, uh, you know, people calling the governor and saying, hey, you need to p make sure this fire gets put out because it's burning my timberland. And then um, the governor calling the head of Cal Fire and the head of Cal Fire calling his people on the ground and saying, like, hey, what can we do to be more aggressive here? So, you know, in some cases, um, it just results in a lot of um, personal strain between the people that are charged with fighting the fire, the humans that um, are supposed to implement the direction from their bosses. So this fire that we're on right now is burning in the checkerboard. And what we see, we see some really distinct patterns in the land management history of where this fire is burning. Uh, similar to what we see in um, in other places. So turn off the ownership here and we'll talk a little bit about some of these patterns we're seeing. So now we've got the land ownership just as outlines. You can see that the private timberland has had um, a lot more active management. So um, this particular ownership um, for, I don't know how long it's been owned by a Michigan Cal Corporation and uh, just sold to a new owner. But their strategy here was to uh, do clear cuts in plantation forestry. So on the first day of the fire, the fire started um, in McKinney Creek Road, and it, it ran hard with a lot of spotting. And one of the things that happens with these clear cuts is um, they are dry, there's no shade, and they're a good place for a spot fire to become established. Also, um, a lot of these plantations, once they've been grown for, you know, eight to 12 years, they get thinned. And then the thinning slash, um, all the little trees that get thinned, just they get usually left in the woods. So what that creates is this landscape that's um, super dry, no shade. And when you have a fire, if a spot fire hits here, it's gonna run up this ridge and it's gonna spot to here. So given how dry everything is already, it's, um, it's hard to parse out the overall impact of this. But what we've been seeing on a lot of fires uh, in the past 10 years is just that these clear cut areas burn with a lot rapider um, kind of fire spread. And you know what I hear from ops people on the ground is like, man, these cut blocks are burning like the sun. Um, here's the Forest Service section. The Forest Service clear cut um, years ago. So they got a lot of dense um, plantations that they put in and maybe they never thinned. So, um, we talk a lot about kind of forest management and active forest management and um, needing to do more active forest management. And I think the point is that under kind of extreme conditions that not all management's created equal. You can manage the hot landscape and still have really fire susceptible land. And that we need to, when we talk about forest management and active forest management, that we need to make sure that we're talking about actions that result in better fire resiliency which uh, needs to include prescribed burning, right? It's like the only tool we really have to manage fuel's landscape scale. So the landowner here, the private landowner, has taken enormous losses in this fire. Uh, but they already, you know, over the past 100 years, took most of the value out of this landscape, right? Like that's why they're kind of clear cutting and starting over is that they've got a lot of this land that's been kind of picked and plucked over for the last 
hundred years and there's not a lot of timber value there. So the strategy here is like, hey, let's just mow down what's left, plant some you know, good trees, better genetics, grow trees for the future. Uh, plantation forestry is kind of taking a big hit in California. In the last you know decade, we're seeing just huge losses in young stands. So th everything, the foresters, everyone's all learning as we go along at the same time about uh, our options really and what isn't, isn't gonna work. But what isn't working right now is uh, kind of minimally tended plantations in super dry, hot landscapes with lots of fires. So that's kind of a little background. Uh, forestry is complicated, of course. Uh, we talk about it a lot on the lookout and um, you can check out other videos here on the topic. Uh, we'd love to talk to you if you're a forester or if you got, um, you know, history managing this land. Uh, just wanted to come back to um, real quick to what we saw over here on the beaver fire. We're just these unmanaged kind of 60 year old plantations uh, burned really hot. Uh, fire blew up so intensely that it trapped some firefighters. They didn't die, but um, it was a, an incident. And then we see that across the whole landscape. You know, I worked on the, um, if we head over towards Happy Camp here, uh, worked on the frying pan fire in 2014. And a lot of that fire really ripped in stands on the Klamath Forest that had been logged in the 70s and 80s and then uh, replanted with dense you know, plantations and then just kind of left alone. And uh, nature is kind of telling us like, hey, I don't like that. And uh, so our whole legacy of land management spelling out across the landscape with fires, fires kind of resetting it to, you know, what it sees as a, a more uh, acceptable <laughs> natural balance. Everything in this image here burned in 2014. And so uh, just to point out that, you know, fire is kind of resetting the clock on a lot of our past mistakes and that uh, there's a lot for us to learn from what we're seeing in past fires and what we'll see with this fire and hopefully we're learning lessons from this. Anyway, that's the coverage for today. Uh, we'll post updates through the day and uh, if you stuck with us this long, uh, consider subscribing to the Lookout YouTube channel and uh, we're supported on Lookout by donations. So if you like this stuff and want to support it, uh, feel free to send us some money on thelookout.org on our PayPal. Thanks a lot. <laughs>